What's up everybody, welcome back to the channel, and welcome to another Pokemon Sword and Shield VGC 2021 video. Now, this is a topic I've been meaning to talk about for quite a while. Um, the whole gist of my channel is, well, for one, it's me making and using VGC teams. However, uh, the, the draw that I've seen a lot of people uh, just congratulate me for, I guess, is I tend to build around my favorites and find pretty good success with them. Like, honestly, like, I... It's, it's very rare that I have a favorite Pokemon that I haven't been able to build a team with. Uh, basically, today's video is going to be talking about how you can also go about using your favorites on a VGC team uh, and my thought process when it comes to making teams around Pokemon that would be usually considered unviable. And yeah, I'll also go through a couple of example teams of Pokemon that uh, I've managed to use in a competitive format that I, a lot of people were like, nah, nah, there's no way you can use it. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video at any point in time, do me a favor, leave a like on it, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications because I bring you guys daily Pokemon Sword and Shield of VGC content, and comment down below what Pokemon you want to use on a team that you haven't yet found success with, and let me know what ideas you have for it. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into the video. So I guess we should start from the beginning. Uh, I'll go through a couple of examples of teams that I've made and how I went about making those teams. So this is a team from 2018. If you don't know what the 2018 VGC format was, it was essentially um, every Pokemon from the National Dex is allowed except for Legendaries. It's similar to what Sword and Shield's format is right now. However, you know, with the full Pokemon like National Dex included. My favorite Pokemon of all time has to be Honchkrow. It's, in fact, it was the original mascot of the channel and it's the namesake of the channel, Moxie Boosted. Honchkrow isn't really the best Pokemon. <laughs> uh, you see, Honchkrow has excellent HP in 125, a phenomenal attack stat of 125, or uh, was it, phenomenal HP of 100 and an attack stat of 125. Uh, but it has really garbage defenses in 52 and 52. It has a decent special attack stat at 105, and if it had like 90 base speed, I'd honestly think it would be used in VGC. Even 100 like would be phenomenal. 100 would be amazing. 85 maybe, uh, but 71 is like really, really dull, and it's hard to find a reason to use Honchkrow in a VGC format. Well, 2018, I really wanted to use it. I made it my goal to find a team that Honchkrow could fit on, and this was the team I ended up coming up with. Something that you need to know when it comes to using your favorite Pokemon is... Um, at least my basic rule of thumb, if you want to succeed, you're going to need to find something that this Pokemon can do that other Pokemon can't do better than it. Granted, you could say, okay, it's my favorite, so I'm going to use it in the same role as a different Pokemon and just accept that it's going to be worse. Uh, but I think that if you truly want to justify using it, you need to find something that it does better than any other Pokemon, something that other Pokemon can't do. What I used Honchkrow for on this team was a surprisingly bulky Parish Song user and overall just sweeper, and also a Tailwind Setter. It was a couple of things. It was a Parish Song user, a Tailwind Setter, and a sweeper. Let me go over how this team functioned. It's centered around Honchkrow and Tapu Bulu mainly. However, it had a ton of support from Incineroar, Milotic, uh, Mega Manectric, and Gothitelle. How I would typically lead off was Manectric and Honchkrow. Manectric would be able to snarl anything that Honchkrow wanted to face off against uh, that it couldn't typically deal with. And one of the most annoying Pokemon, at least for this team, prior to me adding Honchkrow, was Tapu Lele. Tapu Lele is a decently fast Pokemon, at least back then it was considered decently fast. Uh, it has, I believe, 95 base speed or 90 base speed, and it has a phenomenal 130 base special attack stat. And back then, uh, Psychic Terrain, which it did set up, boosted your Psychic type attacks by 50%. So I had two Dark types to make sure I could switch in on it, and I had a Gothitelle to resist the hit. Tapu Bulu was able to set up terrain to, you know, decrease the damage from psychic moves. However, Honchkrow had an especially fun role in beating uh, in beating a Tapu Lele. To Honchkrow, Tapu Lele was food. It was a free plus one in Honchkrow's world. Uh, what I would do is I would lead off and I would snarl against a Tapu Lele. And from there, I'd be able to set up a Tailwind for free with Honchkrow since Tapu Lele was unable to Oko this Honchkrow spread with a Moonblast. From there, Honchkrow was able to either go for a, uh, a I, I wanted to say Max Airstream, but it was Flyanium Z Brave Bird, I forget the name of it, Supersonic Sky Strike, into the Tapu Lele, or a Rob Brave Bird, depending on if it was able to take the recoil. Honchkrow at that point 
was at plus two speed, able to outspeed pretty much everything in the format um, because of the Tailwind it just set up, and it was at plus one attack. From that point on, it was able to KO whatever it wanted with a Brave Bird or a Sucker Punch, respectively. Uh, Kamoa was not able to take a Brave Bird. Uh, in fact, if I was able to get a KO with Brave Bird without wasting my Flying MZ, this Honchkrow spread was able to one-shot a Tapu Fini at plus one with Flying MZ. So I was able to do all that stuff. Along this time, or around this time, Chansey was also going around. So what I wanted was a surefire way to beat Chansey, and Parish Song was one of those ways I could beat it. As you can see, I do have a Shadow Tag Gothitel, so Parish Song was a really cool thing I could use with this Honchkrow. Uh, what I was able to do is I was able to create an unwinnable game for Chansey players, because they had to choose whether they wanted to uh, skill swap a Soundproof onto their Chansey, or skill swap a Magic Bounce onto their Chansey or a Magic Guard to make sure they couldn't get toxic. So I just had both on the same team, and that was really cool. Uh, yeah, so basically it was just Mega Manectric supporting the Honchkrow, allowing it to outspeed whatever it needed to. It was a really cool team, and I had a lot of fun using it. And I found decent, uh, decent success with it, and I had a great time with it. So yeah, uh, that was the one thing Honchkrow could do. It was that very particular situation where Honchkrow was one of my best options. So that was really fun. And a lot of people at first were like, that's a Honchkrow, he doesn't know what he's doing. Trust me, this team was absolute fire. So now, fast forward to... Um, like my Players Cup teams. And Players Cup was a point in time where I was like, okay, well, it's a very low risk tournament. I wanna use whatever I can that I really like. So my three project Pokemon were uh, Thievil, Marowak, and Golisopod respectively. Like for Players Cup one, Players Cup, or no, player, because Players Cup one, I didn't qualify. I tried to use Flapple and I just had awful luck. Uh, but Players Cup two qualifier, I wanted to use uh, in uh, Thievil. Players Cup 2 actual tournament, I wanted to use Marowak, and Players Cup 3 qualifier, I wanted to use Golisopod. So what do these Pokemon do better than other Pokemon? Like I said, uh, you need to find a niche for a Pokemon that other Pokemon can't do better. I actually made an example here. So let's say that your favorite Pokemon is Yuxi, and you say, I really want to use Yuxi. Well, what does Yuxi have? It's pretty defensive. It's got 75 HP, 130 defense, 130 special defense. I know, I'll use it as a Trick Room setter with Psychic, Alex, Switch, and Helping Hand. Except, uh-oh, Spidudios. It's Cresselia, and Cresselia exists, and it has the exact same typing, it has all the same tools, and it does the job just honestly much better. It's just slightly less fast, but it's bulkier in every sense. The difference between 75 and 120 HP is huge, so even though it's 10 lower on the physical defense side, it outclasses Yuxi by a long, long margin, or by a, a huge margin. So you can't really justify using Yuxi over Cresselia in the situation because a lot of people be like, well, why don't you just use Cresselia? And as soon as you switch out Yuxi for your Cresselia, you're going to find out like, oh yeah, they were right. This is just a hundred times better. So you need to find something that Yuxi can do that Cresselia can't do. Now, if we look at Cresselia's move pool, it has a lot of tools. So it's very difficult to actually find something that Yuxi can do better than Cresselia. Uh, and I actually did find one thing and it took me a while to find it. Cresselia does not have access to Imprison. Yuxi does. Yuxi, with such a high speed stat, can actually pull off something really fun. Uh, if you're facing off against a Trick Room team, or if your team has a general Trick Room weakness, but also sometimes wants to be in Trick Room, sometimes you have that situation where like, okay, I don't want to face Trick Room, but occasionally I want to set up Trick Room. Uh, you can actually use Yuxi as a way to just deal with that. Uh, Chandelure did something similar, but let's say you already have a, you know, a huge, huge weakness to the stuff that Chandelure is weak to. Like, let's say you already have a ground weakness. You might be able to fit Yuxi onto a particular team in that situation. Yuxi would be able to Trick Room whenever it wanted. If you didn't want to face Trick Room, you can imprison the Trick Room. And because it's so bulky with max HP, you'd be able to take whatever. And at 95 base speed, you can actually guarantee you got the imprison off um, before anything like uh, base 90 speed Pokemon, like uh, Galarian Moltres. This is one speed faster than Timid Galarian Moltres, so it won't be able to flinch you with... Um, Fiery Wrath, that's something that's really huge. So you'd be able to get the Imprison off safely. Psychic is just there for coverage. However, you could switch it out for whatever you wanted. Another thing that Yuxi could do if you really wanted, um, by the way, Imprison also prevents them from using Protect, which is really huge. You could also run Yawn on it. So there are a couple of different things that Yuxi can do. You have to take advantage of what this Pokemon specific tools are. So how did I, impl or how did I apply that mindset uh, with my Players Cup teams? So Players Cup 1, I did it really bad. 
<laughs> I did it really poorly. I just tried to use Flapple when I could have just used Dragapult and done a lot better. So that, that was my mistake. I could have used Dragapult done so much better in the tournament, but I wanted to use Flapple and I didn't find something that Flapple does that Dragapult doesn't do better. So Player's Cup 2, learn my lesson. What did I change? Well, my project Pokemon was Thievil. Thievil has the ability Unburden and I could pair it up with an Indeedee for Psychic Seed shenanigans. Uh, it's pretty bulky on the special side with 70, 92 after the uh, Psychic Seed goes off. Physically defensively, it's not the most bulky thing, but with Unburden, it's pretty much the fastest thing in the format. So I wanted to take full advantage of this. I wanted Thievil to be a key player in my team. So what I did is I said, okay, I am going to take its ability and I'm going to get the most out of Thievil in every single matchup that I can. However, you can't expect to use it in every single match. Uh, another thing you need to take into account is don't overextend the Pokemon. If you're going to be using a Pokemon, like my Thievil, I don't expect it to beat a Conkeldurr. I'm not going to pack Psychic on it and try to EV it so Psychic is going to beat Conkeldurr. You need to know its limits and on the team that you put it on, make sure that you're actually providing Pokemon that can cover it. So as you can see on this team, if I was facing a Conkeldurr, well, you know, I have Ndidi to one-shot it, I have Togekiss to eat the hit, I have Gyarados to intimidate or eat the hit. So yeah. Thievil, what did it do? Well, when I let off with Indeedee and Thievil, I'd be able to pick up pretty much a free KO on at least one or two Pokemon uh, by going for a Fake Tears and then going for Choice Scarf, Modest, Expanding Force, which does so much damage. It does so, so much damage. And you might be saying, well, Marcos, if Thievil is just there to Fake Tears, why not just use Whimsicott? Whimsicott also has Fake Tears and Beat Up. Well, the whole point of this was to have an unfake outable lead. Whimsicott is able to be faked out and if I'm running Psychic Terrain, I'm actually not able to click uh, Fake Tears against anything since it's considered a priority move. Grounded Pokemon would be immune to Fake Tears, so Thievil is the fastest unburdened Pokemon that is this bulky. Some people said, why not just use Unburdened Liopard? Uh, unburdened Liopard, for one, like it, it doesn't get access to beat up, I believe, and it also uh, is not nearly as bulky as Thievil with 7092. So what Thievil could do is it could, you know, secure that free KO, but it was also able to provide Snarl support. Things like Charizard weren't actually able to one-shot Thievil, and I actually wrote a whole Reddit post about Thievil's matchup versus Rain. This lead was so free versus Rain because Thievil was able to snarl a Kingdra to the point where, one, you're already usually outspeeding Kingdra, uh, and two, Kingdra wasn't going to one-shot you, and in fact, you could even create a situation where uh, Kingdra wouldn't be able to knock out the Thievil at all since you're able to outspeed it and snarl over and over again while your other Pokemon just takes care of it on its own. So that was one lead. So what do I do if uh, it turns out that, you know, Ndidi goes down, they deal with the lead effectively? Well, if you notice, I almost never Dynamax Ndidi or Thievil here. So I was able to have actually two really solid Dynamax options in the back, three if you count Gyarados and Togus. Um, Cobalion was running Life Orb and it has the ability justified. So uh, once I punched a hole in the team with Ndidi Thievil on lead, they would usually target Ndidi first. I was able to actually just go for a beat up onto Cobalion and just sweep with like max airstream max knuckle max steel spike and with cobalion and indeedee on the same team if i wanted to predict them to lead off incineroar and then go for a darkest lair into my indeedee since incineroar actually takes this lead on very very well what i could do is on my first turn switch out the indeedee for the cobalion take that darkest lariat get plus one from justified and then get four more justified boosts from uh beat up on feeble which would give me plus five, and then it was pretty much just game. There were so many games in the Players' Cup qualifier where I would just win turn one because of that. Um, and yeah, if Cobalion went down, <laughs> Thievil was also able to uh, activate Dragapult's weakness policy, and it was another solid Dynamax option. Sometimes I would just actually lead off with um, Thievil and Indeedy, and then I would let the Indeedy go down and just go into Dynamax, Dragapult, and beat up that thing, which is really nice. Uh, Dynamax Dragapult is really solid. Uh, from that point on, it was just like standard Dynamax format stuff. I was running Scope Lens, uh, Togekiss with Follow Me, Air Slash, Dazzling Gleam, Protect, because I could also just go Dragable Togus on lead if I wanted. And I had a Safety Goggles Gyarados to help me deal with a very annoying matchup with uh, Venusaur. I never lost to a Venusaur the whole qualifier just because of Safety Goggles Dynamax Gyarados. So yeah, that's how I took full advantage of Thievil. Uh, it was able to do something that its contemporaries couldn't. Uh, it was able to do the job better. This particular job, mind you, it was able to do this job better than Lyopard, than Whimsicott. So that was the situation where I was able to use Thievil. Next up, I wanted to use Marowak. And this one was actually pretty easy. Marowak is just a solid Pokemon overall. Um, I like Marowak a lot. And this was my team for Players' Cup 
2, and since I'm actually competing in the tournament, I needed it to be solid, so this is how much faith I had in the team. Basically, Marowak was a phenomenal partner for Galarian Moltres, so Galarian Moltres could switch in on dark moves for the Marowak. Uh, they were both weak to rock, which was kind of an issue, but I already had a couple of things to deal with rock Pokemon, so I didn't mind it too much. Uh, and the Lightning Rod support was great for the Galarian Moltres. Something that this team struggled with really, really heavily was the Glacier matchup. So I said, okay, I'm going to use Alolan Marowak as a basically a counter to Trick Room. I didn't have my own Trick Room, but I had minimum speed um, Alolan Marowak, so that way I could Dynamax it. I could pretty much one-shot Dusclops with, um, you know, Max Phantasm, uh, and I was able to threaten Glacier a lot with just having Dynamax Max Flare with a Thick Club Marowak. Uh, but another thing that was really cool is I actually EV'd this thing, so I'm guaranteed to eat a Max Quake from a non-Life Orb Glacier, from like the standard Glacier at the time that was running weakness policy. If it wasn't boosted, I was able to actually live that Max Quake with this specific spread. And I was able to go for a Burning Jealousy since they actually undersped me in Trick Room. They would get that Max Quake off trying to one-shot the Marowak, expecting to one-shot the Marowak, failing to do that, and then getting burned in return for that. And then from then on, it was a lot easier since they didn't secure a KO, they didn't get their Chilling Nay boost, and they were burned. They lost so much from that turn that I could just sweep with like Dynamax Kartana or whatever need be. Uh, and because I was running Marowak, I actually ended up swapping out the Regieleki that was originally on this team for a Tapu Koko because Tapu Koko was actually able to run a move that wouldn't get redirected by my Marowak. And granted, a few times they did actually Thunderbolt like an idiot next to my Marowak, uh, but the reward I got from running Tapu Koko was better overall. And yeah, the Tapu Koko was actually able to switch in on a move for Marowak too. If I was facing off against an Urshifu Dark, Tapu Koko could come in and uh, just Dazz and Gleam it to one shot. So yeah, that was how I took um, Marowak Alola and actually made pretty good use of it in Players Cup 2. I had a great time using this team. And finally, Players Cup 3, my most recent team that you guys already saw the video on yesterday. If you want a more in-depth breakdown on this Pokemon, you can check it out in the uh, it, on my channel. It's the previous video I uploaded. Uh, I wanted to use Golisopod, and Golisopod, is, its contemporaries are essentially, in this situation, in this context, next to Colossal, its contemporaries are uh, Sneasel, Dragapult, and Urshifu Water, which Sneasel we're not even going to talk about since it's not really relevant anymore. So what does... Golispod do better than Urshifu Water and uh, Dragapult? Well, Dragapult isn't able to be faked out, uh, and it's able to provide things like Will-O-Wisp support, Light Screen support, that sort of thing. And that's really, really huge for Colossal. On top of that, it's super fast, which is super nice for just activating the weakness policy. Urshifu Water is a very strong Pokemon that can hit through Protect. It's overall just a really solid Pokemon that doesn't need to be a support set. It can run a Focus Sash reliably, and it can Aqua Jet the Colossal to activate Steam Engine. What does Glyspot do versus this? Well, for one, Glyspot has a positive matchup versus opposing um, Urshifu and opposing uh, Dragapult. It's able to win versus them most of the time, even though it like doesn't have a stab move to hit Dragapult. It's just able to wall it out because it's really high defenses. Um, but it has access to Wide Guard, which is something that neither of those other Pokemon do. Wide Guard is especially important in this format because it's able to block things like Earthquake and Muddy Water. Forgive me if you heard this before because I talked about this in my previous video. Emergency Exit is the biggest issue with this. So Emergency Exit is something that forces the Glyspod to switch out when it hits less than half health. So to circumvent this issue and to circumvent the issue of like Rage Powder Redirection, um, I added safety goggles to make sure I don't take any hail chip damage or sandstorm chip damage that would force me into emergency exit, and I would avoid getting redirected by Rage Powder. So I could Aqua Jet into my Colossal, and let's say hypothetically they had something that would want to target my Golisopod, and I was relatively certain that this Golisopod was going to get switched out at the end of the turn. Well, lo and behold, what I could do is I could actually pack a Venusaur in the back, go for a max flare with this Golisopod, set up the sun, the emergency exit would proc when my Golispod gets knocked down, or gets knocked down, and I would get in the Venusaur for free, and I'd be able to click a Sleep Powder or a Sludge Bomb or whatever I wanted at double speed. That was the main gist of what Golispod did on this team. On top of that, the other huge thing is that, uh, like Colossal is really good versus Metagross and Glacier. However, it never wants to eat a Max Quake. This Golispod, it can wall out Metagross and Glacier, like they can barely 4-hit KO this Pokemon with their max move. So that was another use for Glyspot in the format. With Metagross and Glacier being so common, this was the format for me to use one of my favorite Pokemon of all time. So yeah, uh, 
that's pretty much my mindset when building all of these teams. Make sure that when you use a Pokemon, you don't overextend it. You find a niche for that Pokemon that other Pokemon can't fulfill better. Otherwise, you're just going to be using an inferior product. And finally, just make sure that the team works. Make sure that you feel comfortable with the team and that you can use it correctly. EV them to do what they need to do, but no further. For example, the Glyspod can take the Timid Aleki Electroweb and not get forced out. I didn't expect it to take like Specs Aleki Electroweb. It's just Timid Max Special Attack, non-Specs, non-Magnet. I did as much as I could with it. The Feeble, I didn't calc it to live a close combat because that's pointless. Why would I make it live close combat? It's never going to get close to that. Even if I, like, even if I were to like intimidate something, it's never going to get close to that. So I didn't bother with that. The uh, Marowak, no way was it ever going to take a uh, Galarian Moltres Max Darkness at plus two. Don't expect it to do those things. Find what they do best and use them to their fullest potential in that specific situation. So yeah. Probably not the most organized video, but uh, a video that I feel like I wanted to get out and to allow you guys to just hear my thought process behind team building. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video at any point in time, do me a favor, leave a like on it, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and let me know if you found it helpful. But yeah, with that, I'm going to call it. Have a nice night, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.